Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 2019 Future City Theme webinar. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we have a very exciting program for you. Uh, before we get started, um, could I just get a couple people to click on the raise hand button as long as you can hear me clearly and see the screen that says Future City Clean Water Tap Into Tomorrow. We want to make sure the sound and, all, and uh, visuals are working well. Great. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Oh, my name is Jake Williams, and I'm the program coordinator for the Future City Competition. Um, and we want to thank you for joining us for the annual topic webinar. Um, as you might know, this year's theme for Future City is called Clean Water Tap Into Tomorrow. And your task is to choose a threat to your city's water supply and then design a resilient system to maintain a reliable supply of clean drinking water for your residents. Uh, this webinar is an opportunity to hear from three fantastic subject matter experts who actually work on these issues um, every day. So they'll offer some background information and let you know about what they do um, to solve real world problems. And then by the end of the webinar, I think you'll have a lot of really great material to inspire or expand your own ideas about solutions for this year's challenge for your future city. So before we get into that, I wanted to mention Discover E, which is the organization that runs the um, Future City competition. Um, in addition to Future City, Discover E has a lot of other programs and free resources for educators and students and STEM mentors. Um, so if you're looking for classroom activities, career information, engineering videos, or other content for your school or out of school program, be sure to check out our website, which is discovere.org. The Future City competition wouldn't be possible without the help of our great sponsors and partners, so I want to thank them for their generosity. Uh, in addition to Discover E, the Bechtel Corporation, Bentley Systems Inc., NCEES, and Shell are all final sponsors whose contributions make the finals competition and webinars like this possible. Um, also, NCEES, which stands for the National Council of Examiners for Engineering and Surveying, are also sponsoring the program handbook this year. A couple housekeeping notes for the webinar itself. The platform that we're using is the GoToWebinar um, webinar platform. Um, if the sound quality isn't great for you, you can try calling in on a phone rather than using your um, computer speakers. Sometimes that sound quality um, is a higher quality. Um, so the number is there and you can also access that number um, by clicking on the phone call option instead of the computer audio option on your control panel. And you'll see that phone number and the code to access the um, uh, teleconference line as well. Uh, this recording is going to be posted by the end of the week on futurecity.org slash resources, and everyone who signed up for the program will receive an email with a link to the webinar as well. Uh, following the webinar, we'll have a very brief survey um, with just four or five quick questions about um, your thoughts on the survey, or your thoughts on the webinar, um, and any suggestions or comments you might have so that we can improve it in the future. So it'll only take a couple moments, so please be sure to complete that survey at the end of the webinar. You might have noticed that as an attendee, you're muted. Um, we have hundreds of people watching the webinar now, so it wouldn't be possible to allow everyone's microphone to be on. So uh, to ask a question, just type it into the question box on the control panel. Uh, my colleague, Maggie Dressel, who's the Future City Program Manager, is on the line, and she's monitoring all the incoming questions. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, feel free to just type them in at any time. Um, after all three presenters have spoken, they'll answer as many questions questions as they can. Um, and also just as a reminder, the focus of this webinar is the theme, the topic um, for this year. Um, so if you have technical questions about the competition itself or the deliverables, I'd recommend checking in with the um, educator webinar recording, which is available in the resources section of futurecity.org um, from a couple weeks ago. Um, and you can also always check in with your regional coordinator for program specific resources uh, and questions as well. Um, so we have a great panel of experts today joining us. Uh, Dan Koval from Bentley Systems will be hosting the program. Our speakers are Carol Haddock, the Director of Public Works for the City of Houston, GM, an environmental engineer at CDM Smith, and Joel Johnson, a water distribution computer modeling specialist at Bentley Systems. So now let's get started. 
I'd like to introduce our host and Master of Ceremonies for the webinar, Dan Koval. Currently in his 13th year at Bentley Systems, Dan has spent the last three years managing corporate initiatives programs. As a graduate of the leadership Chester County, uh, Dan has had the opportunity to help numerous nonprofit organizations, both locally as well as globally. This past February, Dan was the keynote speaker at the Future City Finals competition in Washington, DC. Additionally, Dan has spent time abroad in India and Europe and the UK, witnessing the positive impact that Bentley and its colleagues have had um, on the world as a whole. Um, in the past, Dan has mentored eighth grade students at Lionville Middle School for the participation in Future City competition. Additionally, Dan has spent the past seven years as a big brother in the Beyond School Walls Big Brother Big Sister mentorship program hosted by Bentley's hosted at Bentley's corporate headquarters in Exton, Pennsylvania. Thanks for being here, Dan. Take it away. Great, thank you so much, Jake, and thank you for all the attendees on the line for making the time here today to be with us. Uh, as Jake mentioned, I work with Bentley Systems. Hopefully everyone on the call knows what we do. I think that uh, my colleague will be talking about that a little bit later when Joel gets started, but we provide the engineering software for the world's infrastructure and basically everything that the Avengers blow up in their movies, you can redesign with our software. I figure that's the easiest way to explain it. I am very proudly handling the corporate giving for Bentley Systems, and we've been a proud partner of Discover E and the Future City program for over two decades. And so you are all not here to listen to me. We are here to listen from our distinguished panelists, like Jake was saying. And so let me go ahead and introduce our first panelist. It is Carol Haddock. And like Jake had mentioned, she's the director of director of the Houston Public Works, the largest American Public Works Association accredited agency in the nation. The department is responsible for the city's water and wastewater systems, street and so storm drainage systems, and regulation of both public and private development. To accomplish this, the department has a trained workforce of nearly 4,000 people an annual operating budget of 2.1 billion, that's billion with a B, and an annual capital budget of three quarters of a billion dollars. Carol has been at the city for more than 13 years. In her nearly two years in leadership, the department has weathered Hurricane Harvey, set records for water treatment in a day, reduced environmental impacts in both the wastewater and stormwater systems, maintained a next business day pothole program 99% of the time and supported more than $6 billion in development, much of that related to Hurricane Harvey recovery. Carol is a licensed professional engineer in the state of Texas with a civil engineering bachelor's degree from Rice University and has a master's degree in public administration from the University of Houston. Take it away, Carol. Uh, so good afternoon. I hope that everyone is, is able to hear me and that I will get a chat message if you if you can't. Um, it's it's my um, um, pleasure to be talking with you today uh, as you move into your future city challenge uh, and look towards what you uh, might develop as uh, your your competition uh, platform. So we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, a lot of this was covered in the introduction of what uh, Houston Public Works does, but one of the reasons that I, I like to talk about it is because while you may be focused on water in this challenge, as somebody who's responsible for the infrastructure that supports a city on a daily basis, we have to think about everything that we do on a daily basis that supports how people live and how people work, how they get around town, how they have water, how their wastewater goes away, um, how the storm drainage drains. Uh, we're thinking about all of those things, even when we're solving individual problems related to water. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about some of the challenges that we have faced in Houston so that you can think about um, how those might play into what you're, you're moving forward with on your, your competition. So let's go ahead and go to the next, the next slide, please. So in Houston, uh, we, we have, uh, we're not dissimilar from almost anywhere in the United States. Uh, we have great challenges. Um, on a daily basis from weather, uh, what, from uh, uh, different different types of weather or population growth. Uh, we have 
At one point, we had over 10,000 people a month moving to the Houston area. And then we also have challenges uh, just from the, the quality of our natural water in our environment that's found, um, but also from what we are doing with using our water. So let's go into the next slide real quick. So when you're talking about um, stressors and you're talking about vulnerabilities and you're talking about resilience, weather is one of the biggest stressors and one of the biggest risks uh, that we face in a drinking water system uh, when we're trying to identify where we're going to get water from and how we're going to treat water. Everybody knows Houston for flooding. Um, and so we think about Houston as having almost unlimited amounts of water. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, is that Houston has air, times that we have flooding, but we also have times that we have drought. Uh, back in 2011, we, we had a very widespread drought that was throughout the United States and very largely throughout Texas, but it also challenged Houston as well. And so when you're thinking about water supply, you have to think about it in terms of when you have too much rain, you have to think about it in terms of when you have not enough rain. And then there's those unexpected things. And one of the things that we had happen here in Houston was back during that drought in 2011, we had a lot of wildfires. And that is not very common in the Houston area. But what we found out from these wildfires is after we had had those, and then we had rainfall, that the, uh, the, the storm water picked up ash and other pollutants from the fires and brought it into our drinking water supply. And so it was different than we had normally experienced and our treatment plants had to be adapted to be able to treat a different kind, a, a different quality of water to be able to serve our residents. And so when you're looking at setting out your water systems, your water supply, your water treatment, uh, you have to be adaptable, you have to be flexible to be able to adjust to anything that weather might throw at you. Um, so let's go on and go to the next slide. Population. So Houston is currently the uh, fourth largest city in the United States at about 2.3 million people. Um, it, it does not matter where you are in, in the U.S., uh, it doesn't matter where you are in the world. Um, having a water supply to serve those people is, is um, critical to everyday health of the people that are living in those, those um, urban centers and in those cities. Houston not only um, has a 2.3 million people that live inside the city of Houston, but we actually have half a million people that come to the city of Houston every single day to work. Um, that work inside the city of Houston, but don't live inside the city of Houston. So those are variables. Those are things that we have to think about when we're planning for water, um, for how we're building our water, where we're building our water infrastructure, and how we're serving the people that we need to serve. It's, uh, it, it creates, uh, we also have the Texas Medical Center, which is one of the largest medical uh, complexes in the world. And so creating redundancy such that if we have a water line break, uh, that we can serve them from a different direction is a very large part of what we're thinking about in our stressors and our, our uh, vulnerabilities when we're looking at, at those areas with that. And let's move on to the third area that we look at a lot, which is our water quality. So <clears throat> not only are we looking at uh, where our drinking water is coming from and making sure that those sources are protected, we're also looking very much at um, how we are treating that water, making sure that the plants that we build, making sure that the pipe systems and the, the, the pumping systems and everything that we have um, are reliable and that they are checked independently by people that are checking the water where before it comes into our treatment plant, that they are checking the water in our treatment plant and they're trekking the water after it leaves our treatment plant to make sure that the quality of water is safe um, and in, is, meets all of the federal and state requirements for safe drinking water that is delivered to individual homes and businesses. Not only do we have to make sure it's safe, we are now having to do a lot of effort to make sure 
that we're not vulnerable to physical attacks, that we're not vulnerable to people trying to put things into our water systems, that we're always asking ourselves every day, what happens if, what happens if somebody tries to put something in our drinking water lake um, to hurt our population? What happens if somebody tries to um, get into our water system um, by using one of our fire hydrants or using some way uh, that they try to get into our system and introduce contaminants into our system. Uh, we also have to think about um, other things that naturally occur in the water. Uh, sometimes we have uh, natural things that are natural in the vir environment, um, but they are things that would not be safe in the drinking water that we deliver to the house, whether it's bacteria, uh, whether it is uh, um, uh, viruses. Uh, there are things that are that are natural. There are also things that um, are introduced into our, our drinking water systems uh, by humans being here and using them. We also have to worry about uh, used uh, um, prescriptions uh, that we are seeing in our water systems, in our drinking water supplies now. So we're always asking ourselves, what if? And that is where we're, we're measuring the risk of our water system, we're measuring the vulnerabilities, and we're making sure that we are prepared uh, for the, 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 anything that may be thrown our way. So as you move to the last slide, what I would encourage you as you go into your, your challenges on this is that you are, you are thinking about urban water as you, as you go through this. So we're thinking about where the water is coming from, we're thinking about who's using it, how they're using it. And then the last piece that we really want to make sure is that every drop of water that we are using is the most efficient way that we can use it, that we are, we are treating it and not wasting water, that we're delivering it in a way that we're not spilling water um, or wasting water through breaks and leaks. And that uh, at the end of the day, that every drop of water is precious and that it is being used uh, to keep our population safe. And so I look forward to the questions. I believe that uh, that's a, my overview of, of what we think about and our challenges and stresses um, so that you can uh, make sure you're not vulnerable as you're developing your future city. Great, thank you so much, Carol. Really appreciate that. And as we're continuing on, definitely appreciate Carol staying on task with the time there. Great. And let me go ahead and introduce you to our next panelist. GM is an environmental engineer at CDM Smith who specializes in drinking water treatment projects for cities throughout the Northeast and has worked on several studies and designing construction projects for removing contaminants from drinking water. As an environmental engineer, she designs new water treatment facilities and upgrades aging infrastructure, in addition to performing treatment evaluations, regulatory reviews, and water quality analysis. G's favorite part of her job is working on a team of smart engineers and scientists to have a positive impact on communities by helping deliver improved safe drinking water. G is based in Manchester, New Hampshire, and her and in her free time, she enjoys spending time with her family and friends, cooking and adventuring. Off to you, G. Great, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, again, my name is G, like a letter. I'm really excited to be here to talk about how engineering solutions could help address emerging threats to drinking water um, using PFAS as a specific example. So next slide, please. I'm hoping to answer four very specific questions from my presentation. First one being, who is this random woman from a small state of New Hampshire trying to tell me about drinking water treatment? Um, and we'll briefly talk about how tap water is generally treated in very you know, um, general terms. And we'll talk about you know, what are PFAS and how do we treat them from drinking water. Next slide. Um, so who is G? I graduated from the University of New Hampshire, um, which is about an hour north of Boston. I did my bachelor's and master's degrees in environmental engineering. I'm also a very proud immigrant from South Korea. Um, I love my job as an environmental engineer because um, I get to help lots of cities and towns improve their tap water quality. Next slide, please. 
So how is tap water generally treated? Um, hopefully when you go swimming in a river or a lake, you're not sitting there drinking the water from the river or a lake. Um, a water treatment plant uses a series of very important chemical treatment steps um, to treat you know, what natural waters like from lake and river. Um, and the whole purpose of this series of treatment steps is to make sure the water coming out of your tap, like um, Carol mentioned earlier, is, um, is the, tap, the water from the tap is completely safe to drink. Um, sometimes the treatment process involve adding chemicals to remove certain contaminants or filters to remove particulates from the water. And a lot of times disinfection, um, which is sort of like when you use hand sanitizer to um, you know, get rid of the germs from your hands. Um, it's very similar concept to that. A lot of water treatment plants use chlorine to kill any bacteria and viruses from the water. So the whole goal of this series of treatment plants to make sure the tap water delivered to your sink is safe. Next step, next slide, please. Um, if you live in a big city, especially like Houston, Texas, um, your, the water treatment plants in these big cities are very large to make sure they can provide all the water that's needed for lots of people living in these cities. Um, these water treatment plants might have really large filters and basins to hold and treat all that water. Um, they might have very large pumps and pipes to move and flow lots of water and also big buildings to house all this equipment. So there's a lot of equipment and um, infrastructure that goes into water treatment plants sometimes. Next slide, please. So let's talk about PFAS. Um, you might have heard about it because they've been getting a lot of attention in the media and public all over the country, as you can see in some of these um, news article titles. Next slide, please. So what are PFAS? PFAS are emerging contaminants. So what do I mean by emerging contaminants? Um, the, it means that these are contaminants that we haven't thoroughly studied or completely understood yet, but we're still concerned about them from the limited information that we have, so we want to do something about them. So PFAS um, is actually an acronym, acronym for a very long um, word called parent polyfluoroalkyl substances. They are a very broad set of fluorinated compounds. So what do I mean by that? When I say they are a broad set of compounds, um, there are about 3,000 to 4,000 PFAS out there. So just to put it in a context, if you go to a donut shop, right? So if you're like me living in New England, you might go to Dunkin' Donuts and pick up a box of munchkins or donut holes. Um, when you open this box of donut holes, you might have a bunch of different flavors like jelly donut, chocolate glaze, regular sugar glaze, pumpkin spice. So these munchkins are essentially the same, but they're a little different. And if you open the box of PFAS, um, you have 3,000 to 4,000 types of PFAS that are very similar, but a little different. So that's what I mean by a broad set of chemicals. Um, to, I'm showing, I know a lot of you probably don't have a lot of education in chemistry just yet, but you will because it's really fun. Um, I'm showing chemical structures of two most popular PFAS, and you can see the, their number, which represent um, carbon. So these PFAS compounds, especially these two, PFO and PFOS, uh, which are kind of like the most famous ones out there, they're made of these carbon to fluorine bonds. So you can see all of the apps all around the chemicals. And this carbon and fluorine bond is the strongest and the shortest in organic chemistry. So what do I mean by that? And what does it really mean? It means that it's really hard to destroy them. They're really persistent. They're really stable, which also makes them really, really useful. So PFAS have been used in lots of really important uses, like some of the firefighting forms, um, nonstick pots and pens, um, carpet cleaners, waterproof, um, raincoats and some of the coating inside the popcorn so your butter doesn't soak out the, um, the packaging. So these compounds are water resistant, oil resistant, um, grease resistant, um, really good, great stuff, but they might also have some toxic impacts on humans and animals. So next slide, please. 
because PFAS have been used in so many products and manufactured at so many places, um, it's found all throughout the country. So these little dots on the map represent where PFAS have been tested and um, found in ground or water. Um, next slide, please. So how do we treat PFAS from drinking water? Um, there are three most popular um, treatment processes to remove PFAS from drinking water. These are granular activated carbon, or GAC, anion exchange, and membrane systems. Um, GAC and anion exchange, the first two, are similar in a way that they have these little beads. They're tiny, tiny little beads. Um, and these bees are inherently, they're positively charged. So these bees have a positive charge to it. And when it's in water, um, PFAS that has a negative charge in water, um, these bees pull PFAS that are, because the bees have positive charge and PFAS have negative charge, they pull PFAS from drinking water and attract them onto these bees. And that, that's how PFAS is removed from drinking water using GAC and anion exchange. Um, next slide, please. So GAC and anion exchange are, you know, just two of the three options, and they're similar in a way they, they come in these really large pressure filters, like the ones you see in these pictures. Um, so the water with PFAS in it will go in, and it will um, contact all the speeds that are in the filters, and it will come out PFAS-free, like you see in the bottom picture. Um, even though they're similar, they're also very different from each other and have different pros and cons, which makes engineering challenging and really fun at the same time. So GEC is actually really well established drinking water technology. So a lot of water treatment plants are very familiar with it. It's also made from some of the natural carbon materials like coal and coconut shells. So it tends to be actually a little cheaper than anion exchange beads. But GAC needs a little longer um, treatment time, which means that these pressure filters um, have to be a little bigger and taller. On the other hand, anion exchange, it's a newer drinking water technology. Um, it's made from synthetic polymer materials. Um, so it tends to be a, actually a lot more expensive than GAC. However, it requires much shorter treatment time, which means that you know these tall, um, treatment filters, they could be smaller and also shorter. Um, so with either of these treatment technologies, um, you have to worry about, you know, how are we going to get rid of these bees that have PFAS on them? Um, so that's an engineering challenge to be um, considered. Next slide, please. And the last treatment technology that I mentioned are membrane systems. And the most popular type of membrane systems for PFAS treatment is reverse osmosis. Um, so it has this membrane sheets that could remove contaminants from drinking water that's as small as 0.01 micrometers. How to imagine how small that is? Um, as a perspective, each of your hair strand is between 50 to 70 micrometers. So 0.01 micrometer is really, really small to a point that you can even probably see it when it's in your drinking water. So these membrane systems, they're very effective at removing very, very small things from drinking water, but there are a lot of disadvantages or um, cons to consider because these membrane filters are very delicate. It requires a lot of treatment upstream of the membrane, so there are just like more things to consider. Also, because this membrane system pores um, that remove contaminants from the water are so small, the, the pumps, um, the water has to be pumped through this very, very hard, um, which requires a lot of energy and that translates to electricity cost. Um, and another big um, con to consider is um, the membranes end up producing this very this waste stream um, that is highly concentrated with PFAS. So the disposal of this waste stream is an engineering concern to consider when you are evaluating um, treatment options and trying to figure out how to remove emerging contaminants like PFAS from drinking water. Next slide, please. So like I mentioned, whether it's GAC and an exchange or membranes, it all ends up with some sort of media or waste, some sort of you know, solid or liquid stream that needs to be disposed. However, um, there, is, there are lots and lots and lots of research and investigation and testing being done by universities and government agencies to look into complete destruction of PFAS. 
Um, this is still much newer area, um, but there's lots of technologies being um, investigated to um, eventually destroy PFAS from drinking water. Next slide, please. So yeah, here are some of the take home messages from my slides, you know, PFAS, but I really want to add to the fact that PFAS are just some of the emerging contaminants, um, lots of them out there, you know, Carol mentioned some of them, like some of the pharmaceuticals that may end up in your drinking water source. So, you know, 10 years down the road, you know, we don't know what kind of emerging threats that we might be worried about. But what I what I hope to deliver um, the message I'm trying to deliver today is that you know good engineering evaluations and designing of proper treatment um, plans um, can lead to um, really effective solutions of removing these emerging contaminants from drinking water. And they're also really fun because they're challenging. Next slide, please. And that's it. Um, thank you so much for your attention, and I look forward to answering any of your questions later. Thank you so much, G, for that insight and uh, super interesting uh, material there as well. And our final panelist today is Joel Johnson. He is a water distribution computer modeling specialist, also working for Bentley Systems as a, you know, as a commercial vendor of engineering software. That is what, what we do here at Bentley. And so Joel has 25 years of experience in professional engineering and throughout that time he has performed groundwater, surface water, and pipe hydraulic modeling. Joel, Joel grew up in Michigan and has lived in Pennsylvania for the past 20 years. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from Cornell University and a Master of Science degree in Civil Engineering from Michigan Technological University. Joel uses computer models to simulate the water distribution systems of places like San Diego, Atlanta, Detroit, Long Island, and many other cities and towns. With that said, take it away, Joel. Thanks, Dan, and, and uh, I, I definitely win the scariest picture award, so thanks for getting my picture off of the uh, slide and advancing quickly. Um, what I want to talk to the group about is, um, my, my slide says real-time threat monitoring, but what we're going to look at are what are utilities doing today to detect uh, uh, water quality problems in their systems and, and where is the technology leading to, what, uh, what, what does the future uh, hold for us. Um, go ahead to the next slide, please. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll go through a few examples here of what utilities are, are doing to keep their water system safe, and, and these depend both on technology as well as uh, the um, government and the regulations that are appropriate. So, so the first one we'll, we'll talk about is, is monitoring, actually taking samples from the water system and uh, uh, this is done by utilities because they do have to meet requirements on several different chemicals in the water. And these requirements are produced by EPA, they're produced by uh, state and, and local government agencies. Um, so the, uh, the, the water utility has to show that your drinking water is safe and that these chemicals are within acceptable levels or or hopefully not within at all but uh, uh, you, you'll find that, that it's impossible to eliminate everything uh, you just want everything at, at safe levels uh, with, within the water and the advantages of relying on compliance based monitoring are that uh, there are strict penalties for non-compliance the utility has to report these to the agencies and um, there are financial penalties if they, if they don't meet the requirements. There's also operational penalties if they get some uh, positive detections of a chemical that might lead to um, a couple years where they have to sample for that chemical more intensely and, and uh, sample at location. So it costs them more to monitor their compliance uh, for at least a couple of years until they can show the, the water doesn't hit that uh, chemical. Um, positively again. Um, th there are also social uh, uh, disbenefits uh, uh, because these are reported publicly um, and, and utilities have to send reports to their customers as to what's in the water. Um, it, uh, social media spreads <laughs> pretty fast if, if you've got an unsafe level of a, of a chemical in your water that's that's going to get around and, and uh, uh, you'll you'll lose revenue pretty quick people are going to stop 
uh, uh, drinking the water at least, and um, just the perception that the water might be unsafe uh, uh, re really can, can cause utilities a lot of problems. Um, disadvantages of this type of, of system are uh, ju just the length of time. It, it, uh, uh, you, you can't take samples from everywhere in a system, so they are discrete points where you're sampling from. Um, so the system could have issues, and if you don't sample where the issues are, then you don't know about the issues. Um, also, the uh, regulations don't address every chemical that's possible and uh, uh g just had some some great examples of chemicals that are that are new um that that hadn't previously been regulated and and regulations are are now you know just new or just coming out on those uh on those chemicals so so the landscape is changing um but it's a little bit uh, uh slow to react to what's in the water and and Carol mentioned that uh, prescription drugs are, are also uh, problematic, um, that uh, when, when a water source has prescription drugs, a lot of those times uh, uh, that those chemicals are not, uh, not, not even detected because they're not being tested for. Um, so so the, other, the other point I'll make here is that uh, samples are taken after the chemical is already in the system. Um, they're also taken at a discrete location. You don't necessarily know where that water came from in the system, where the chemical might have been introduced, um, and you also don't know where it's going. So uh, you, you don't know things soon enough to do anything uh, uh, proactive, but uh, the, these compliance methods have, have been in place for, for a long time at utilities. Uh, next slide, please. So, so the next uh, level up here uh, would be um, utilities actually doing proactive uh, testing, uh, not not compliance related sampling, but but actually relying on reports from their maintenance personnel, um, from customers themselves about water quality. Um, so, so these can vary in from from people uh, uh, calling into the utility and complaining about uh, taste or, or odor problems with the water. Um, uh, can, can be a, a maintenance crew opening up a hydrant and, and seeing discoloration in, in, in the water coming out. Um, uh, uh, can, can be discrete sampling again. Um, uh, but but uh, you know again these are these are things that uh, will tell you exactly where you have issues. Um, you can investigate and and actually treat water at, at the locations, but uh, again, a disadvantage is you don't really know where the contaminant was introduced, um, how it was generated in, in, in the water system, and uh, where it may have moved to or, or is moving to. Um, and, and again, th th these are things that have, have utilities have been using for decades. They, 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 they use um, uh, customer complaints as as a way of monitoring uh, the system and making sure that uh, they, they identify problems quickly it, it's it's reliable uh, next slide please so the the technology is moving now to the point where you no longer have to uh, discreetly go out and fill a bottle and and send it to a lab in order to to, to test for chemical indicators. Um, so uh, in the last 10 years especially, uh, we've seen a lot of new sensors come on that can actually measure uh, chemical levels within the water, uh, you know, without, uh, these measurements come in, in in real time as a steady stream of data. So, so you can detect uh, when something is, is out of normal range um, because the sensor is there and 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 will measure that the instant that it's detected at that point in the water column. Uh, these can be physical devices. Um, they, they can also be biological systems. There, there's a really interesting system in Pittsburgh that, that uses uh, on the water intake, it uses a series of fish tanks and, and there's different species of fish in each tank, uh, some, some more sensitive to, to contaminants than others. And, and the idea here is as the water comes into the plant and progresses through the fish tanks, um, it's a little morbid, but if they see fish dying, they know that they better shut down the, up, the, the intake 
um, so so that that water doesn't make it further into the plant, and and so they can uh, uh, not not uh, uh, bring unsafe water in. To, to, to the system, and and those have been actually really great. Uh, you know, we we talked about chemicals that that may not be tested for. Uh, Pittsburgh, in particular, had problems with high salt concentrations that were a result of some of the uh, uh, natural gas production in the western part of Pennsylvania. And what what happened is the gas companies were um, using water to uh, to, to as part of the production process of natural gas, they'd actually pump it down into the formations where they're getting the gas and bring it back. And the water that came back had a really high salt content. Um, well, the, then the, the, the gas companies would then just discharge that to, to the uh, uh, local rivers and um, the, the water distribution systems that were then along those rivers further downstream uh, uh, didn't realize that they were getting these high salt concentrations and, and uh, uh, intaking something that they weren't necessarily treating for at their plant. So um, Pittsburgh detected it with this uh, system. They, they actually had the salt water coming into the fish tanks. They saw uh, fish dying and, and, and were able to shut down and, and, and at least let the, uh, the brine water pass and, and then turn the intakes back on to get the get cleaner water. Um, sensors are great because they tell you uh, exactly what's happening at a location and, and they tell you exactly when it's happening. Um, so, so you get this steady stream of data coming in and uh, the technology has, has really increased to the point where these are relatively inexpensive now and, and uh, uh, the sensors have gotten smaller um, so that they're easier to place uh, uh, throughout a, a water system. So you can strategically put sensors at different locations and uh, uh, you've really got a nice warning system. Um, some of the disadvantages are that you can't test for every known chemical. Um, sensors don't tell you where the chemical came from or where it's going. So uh, uh, e even though the technology is getting better and you get a real stream of data, um, it, it you still need a little more to do uh, a predictive and, and shutdown. Uh, uh, next, next slide, please. That's where we'd like uh, uh, Bentley to introduce the concept of computer modeling and what we call digital twins, where you are actually running your utility virtually. Um, you've got a system that's uh, continuously updated by real-time data streams, uh, uh, but also runs a predictive model so that you know the, the chemical composition throughout the system, as well as all the flows and pressures. Um, you can quickly tell not only where a problem is, but where it might have come from and where it might be going. Um, so uh, uh, th this really adds a degree of sophistication in being able to respond to a, a threat um, and, uh, the, the, the disadvantage is it is reliant on those sensors and uh, the, the, the data stream coming in. And uh, with my last slide, I'll, I'll introduce the concept of the hydraulic model. Uh, a, a model is just a mathematical representation of a real system. So a, a computer model is, is showing the uh, location of pipes and, and other facilities, tanks, pumps in, in a system, and, and all of the inputs here are based on the physical data, and the model itself is predicting what you're going to see as pressure and flow and chemical content throughout the system, and, and these are really handy in filling in the gaps of, uh, of places in the system that you can't measure, which is you know 90% of the system you can't put a sensor on. So I'll stop there. I'm over time anyway. Um, <laughs> and thank you. Thank you so much, Joel. Really appreciate that uh, as well. And so we are now at the at the portion here. We're going to have some question and answer time. So I would ask now the audience to write any question that they have for the panel in the question box on the on the control panel there, and please uh, be specific about who you're directing your question to. I believe we're gonna leave up their, their names and headshots there for a few moments as the questions roll in, and I am fairly certain I'm gonna pass this over to 
Maggie, who will be emceeing the question portion of this. Yep. Sure thing. Thanks, Dan. Um, so we've had a lot of great questions coming in um, while the panelists were speaking, so keep those coming. Um, if, to start with a couple general ones, um, and I'll throw this out to any of the three of you who would like to respond. Um, we had a, a general question about what pipes are made of um, and have those materials changed um, kind of as time has gone on and as technology has changed and improved. Um, and where might we be headed um, in the future? So I don't know who wants to speak to that. Hopefully one of you. I, I could start by saying, right. I mean, I, I've, I've done computer models across the nation, so I've seen all kinds of different pipes um, uh, originally, and, and you'll see, you still see some wood stave pipes out in the system. So, so I mean, originally pipe systems were made by hollowing out trees. Um, uh, so certainly that's no longer done. Uh, we've seen that progress to uh, to, to cast iron pipes. Uh, some of the oldest pipes out there are now these old cast iron pipes. Um, some some work really well. Um, cast iron has a, 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 it it degrades if water is not flowing quickly through it. So um, the, there are some of those pipes are troublesome. Some are, are still working great after a hundred years. Um, around World War II that moved to a ductile iron pipe, um, also uh, uh, different types of cement pipes, including asbestos cement. Um, uh, modern day, there's still a lot of uh, ductile iron being placed in systems, um, but, but we've seen a lot of plastics come in. And, uh, uh, you know, plastics are great. Uh, the, the, they, they don't degrade as quickly as some of the, uh, the, the metal pipes. Um, ductile iron also does not degrade w uh, greatly and, and uh, uh, you know, it, it's used where you need extra strength um, or where you've got uh, uh, cars traveling over a street. You don't want to put a plastic pipe underneath that, that might, uh, might crack, but uh, that's the, the nutshell overview of what's, uh, what's out there. I don't know if the other panelists will add to that. So this is Carol with the city of Houston. Um, I will say that that in general, we're putting pipes in the ground today. If they're small um, and going into neighborhoods, we're using the, the PVC pipes. Uh, when we get into the larger pipes, we're typically using, um, you know, a, a, a we'll even sometimes use concrete on our large pipes. When I'm talking large, I'm talking when we get above three feet in diameter, we even have some pipes that are going eight and nine feet in diameter into the ground. And so we'll use um, steel, ductile iron, or even concrete that's reinforced with metal on those largest pipes. Great. Thanks, Carol. I forgot about the concrete. <laughs> that's great. Um, we also had another question, and Carol, this might be um, in your repertoire, but we have a question about how um, kind of cities budget for treating water and, and kind of cost. Of, of that very important service for its residents. Absolutely. So the um, one of the things that's important for people to understand is that the cities are not allowed to make money on treating water. So we actually have to uh, budget very carefully to cover our costs. So we look at the cost of the people that actually work to run the system the cost of the electricity. There's a lot of electricity that's used in our treatment plants and also in um, distributing that water throughout the city. Uh, we have the costs of the chemicals, as you heard um, G talk about the chemicals that we use to treat drinking water. Uh, and then we also have uh, the costs of putting the pipes in the ground that are actually part of those rates that we charge. Now, when you think about all that, you think it'd be really, really expensive. But I will tell you that in the city of Houston, uh, we can treat 1,000 gallons of water for about a dollar fifty. Wow! When you stop and think about that, how much do you pay for a single bottle of water that's not even a gallon at the at the store, versus how much can we treat a thousand gallons of water for? Impressive. It is, isn't it? This is it G. Is. I think it's also really important to add that um, not only tap water, such water that's produced by, you know, water treatment plant in Houston and many other facilities, it is held against much more um, harsher standards by the government. 
um, like on federal government and state governments um, versus bottled water. So not only bottled water is uh, much cheaper in cost, but also higher in quality. I'm going to add one to that, uh, having modeled for the city of Atlanta and knowing that Coca-Cola is one of their customers. Um, a lot of times the bottled water is just tap water from the uh, system that, that, that may have gone a little extra uh, filtering or treatment, but uh, a, lot, a lot of cases you're just drinking tap water anyway. Well, great insight there. Thank you. Um, we had another question, um, and gee, this might be in your wheelhouse. Um, about the different chemicals that are used um, to disinfect water um, and how um, kind of how you make sure you're using the right amount, not too little, so it actually gets disinfected, but not too much, so it's not to harm, um, you know, the folks who are drinking the water. Can you speak to yeah. that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So um, some of the chemicals, especially chlorine, has been studied very extensively for decades. Um, it's been used as a disinfecting chemical for many, many years, there's a lot of guidance, whether it's from EPA or state governments, in terms of how to design a proper disinfection system. Um, so that's really helpful. And second, there are ways you could test them um, on a bent scale. Um, so there's ways you can test and kind of um, fine tune your chemical dose. And really, I wanna add that almost all of the chemicals that are used at water treatment plants are approved by um, national um, organization like NSF to um, be safe for drinking water. So um, a lot, almost all of the water treatment plants are using only those approved chemicals for drinking water. Carol, I don't know if you wanna add anything um, else to that maybe. Well, I, to be honest with you, I think you, you covered it really well there. Um, it, it's a matter of, of continually monitoring, continually testing and having people um, just make sure that we're we're <clears throat> we're always making sure that every drop of water is absolutely safe. Yes, every water treatment plant has very rigorous um, rigorous sampling protocols and um, water quality checks. So that helps keep everything in check. Great, thank you. Um, we've also had several questions come in related to desalination and kind of that process and its effectiveness as our teams start to think about, you know, where they might have to turn to um, for water supply um, if their future or if the city, you know, has some sort of threat. Um, can anyone speak to desalination and kind of just touch on that for a moment? Yeah, this is G. Um, actually, one of the three treatment technologies we talked about today, which is the reverse osmosis membranes, um, mm -hmm. is very popularly used desalination treatment process because it could just remove lots of really small particles and dissolved ions from ocean water. Um, I know desalination is definitely becoming an important um, part of supplying drinking water in many areas that are running out of fresh water, for example, like Florida, because much of their groundwater has been impacted um, by various um, reasons, or um, groundwater getting ocean water sipped into it, um, and California. So a lot of states that are close to the ocean front, desalination is definitely becoming, um, uh, is getting more focused as a um, water supplier option. Um, but as I mentioned in my presentation, um, using membrane systems like in reverse osmosis and you know all of the pre-treatment that's required before you could use membrane systems. Um, it's very chemical intensive um, and also high pumping um, intensive. So there's a lot of engineering consideration that come into design um, such desalination plan. But again, it's fun, it's challenging um, and it's important. We, we so had a user in Australia that uh, use desalinization in in combination with their regular water supply, and because desalinization was was uh, uh, expensive, they only wanted to use it in when when they could predict that their other sources wouldn't meet demand. So they were using a real time model to predict when weather events would affect their system and when they would have to turn the desal plant on. Um, but but minimize its usage. So and this is Carol with with the city of Houston again, and I, and I will say that 
when you look at it from an individual city's perspective, a city like Houston, who gets a lot of rain, desal doesn't necessarily look like a really good economic option. But when I step back and look at the entire state of Texas or even a larger area, some areas that don't get any rain um, or don't get as much rain, desal may become a good option for the city of Houston in the future so that the, the water that we're putting in lakes for rain could actually go and, and be water for other areas of the state as well. And so uh, I think that you will see when you're talking about resilience and you're talking about redundancy, I think you'll see these other types of water, whether it's desal treatment through desalinization or whether it's adding groundwater or reusing wastewater, that you'll begin to see that those are the options that make us less um, vulnerable to these, these weather threats by making those options. And I do believe that desalinization will become part of that discussion. Great. Um, thank you all very much. Um, I had a couple questions about um, some studies that our teams have already um, delved into their research. Um, they found some studies um, from universities that show potential about using biotechnologies to remove rust and filter water and break down toxins um, using things like fungus and bacteria. Um, have any of you, it seems like an emerging um, idea, have any of you come across this? Uh, in your day-to-day -day work um, or heard about it through the grapevine? And uh, do you have any um, input on it? This is G, and I've definitely heard about what you're talking about. Um, and it is a very cool concept. And actually treating, you know, at wastewater treatment plants that treat, you know, what gets flushed down your toilet, what gets, you know, flushed down into the drains from your showers and sinks, a wastewater treatment plants using biological process with microbes and bacteria to remove contaminants is a very popular process in, at wastewater treatment plants. It's not as popular in drinking water, but um, it does take time for a new technology such as what you described to go from, you know, testing phase in university labs to full scale. So um, we should, I mean, as an industry as a whole, we should continue investing in new technologies like what you described. and. Um, where it goes and hopefully it leads to effective treatment solutions for emerging contaminants especially. Great. Maybe our teams will come up with some really interesting futuristic ideas. Um, great. Um, I, I just wanted to flag um, for lots of people are, are asking questions about research resources and we do have um, a couple documents available on Future Cities website if you go to our resources section. Um, we have a slew of links that you can um, check out to continue your research as you go. Um, and Jake, are we out of time or do we have time for one more? Uh, we have time for one more quick question. Okay, um, and this might be a, a nice quick, just like what would you do question for um, all the panelists. Um, a lot of our kids are thinking about, you know, different, different threats and whatever that threat may be, whether it is, you know, a natural disaster or hurricane, whatnot. Um, what is the kind of first step? What what would you do um, if something was to happen to your city's water supply? What's the first thing that you um, would undertake in order to uh, mitigate the situation and uh, ensure some some clean water for your citizens? And that's probably a loaded question to end on, but just like first thing. <laughs> yeah, I don't well, know if there's a quick answer there. Um, yeah. uh, Carol probably has the best answer, so we'll save her for last. Um, <laughs> uh, from from my perspective, uh, being a computer modeler, uh, uh, what I would do is evaluate um, where is that contaminant going? Where, where is it in the system? Where is it going? Uh, who's going to be affected? Uh, be be aware of your your public notification system so that you can can warn people to to boil their water if necessary or or to not use the taps. Um, look for valves and pumps that you can close to isolate the uh, the, the the contamination. So so uh, you know one way would be to to stop the water from moving in the pipes and 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 isolate it and then then get into that area and. and get the, uh, the the dirty water out, per se. Um, I agree with Joel that Carol will probably have the best answer. Um, 
But I'll, you know, Joel also had some really, really great um, points on how he would respond to it. But um, I would like to focus on the fact that responding to a situation like that requires a lot of smart people and really great teamwork. You know, I'm just an engineer in a bigger picture. You know, you need like contractors who could build a solution. You need um, state agent, regulatory agencies who could approve such um, temporary treatment of a emerging contaminant present in your water. Um, you need you know, manufacturers who could provide these treatment equipments quickly. So there's a lot of teamwork and um, a lot of moving parts um, that require big picture thinking, but also really good detail work to make it happen. Terrific. So Carol, have anything to Carol, add? I'm, I'm going to start off by saying that the 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 way that this is all being set up and the initial questions you're asking um, are the 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 right way to approach it. Your goal is never to have your water system go down to begin with. To plan for hurricanes, to plan for um, you know, um, droughts to plan for all of those natural disasters on the front end so that you're not having to respond on the back end. And, and, and since you're going in this from the beginning and you're being asked these questions up front, you've got the, the, the first part of this down. A lot of the problems that we as a public entity that like the city of Houston has faced in the past have been when people haven't thought about 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the road, how many people might live here? Um, will it? Will we ever have a drought in Houston? We, they haven't asked those questions, and so our system wasn't built to withstand them. And so, the 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 best thing you can do to be ready is to ask yourself those hard questions before you start. Then the second part of that, um, and I really appreciate you saying this, Joel, was that you've got to have the the messaging and the transparency. Drinking water is so critical to to people's health. And any time a drinking water system gets compromised, you have to be very transparent and you have to be very, very loud about what the threat is and what people can and can't do with the system. Uh, the city of Austin recently almost converted to um, bottled water for several weeks because of flooding that overwhelmed their plant, their their drinking water plant. And so they had to be, you know, they had to be on the news, they had to be in the media, they had to provide water to their, they had to buy bottled water to provide to their customers. So those are the type of backups that you have. One of the neatest things that we have, um, you talked about Atlanta and uh, Coke. Here in Houston, we actually have um, water contracts with Budweiser. And in an emergency, they can water and use it in the emergency. And so you've got to have all of those contingencies for in whatever the emergency is, whether it's a drought that's gone too long or whether it's a, a storm that's taken out a plant or we lose power or any of those things. You've got to have partnerships, sometimes with private companies like Coke or Budweiser, uh, sometimes with other cities. But you, the, the biggest thing you can do is think about anything that might happen, do the best you can to be prepared for it, and then make sure you have the partnerships with the private, with the media, um, and with your elected officials to make sure that you can make the decisions and do the things you need to do to get back on track. Excellent. Well, um, thank you very much, everybody. This is Jake again. Um, uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, there were a lot of excellent questions uh, we weren't able to get to, but like Maggie mentioned, be sure to check out the resources section of futurecity.org. Um, and uh, just a couple of quick things I wanted to say. A big thank you to Carol and G and Joel um, for being an awesome panel. Um, and also to Dan for being a fantastic MC. Thank you very much for guiding us through this great webinar. Um, and thank you all of you for joining us. I hope you learned something and had a good time. Uh, don't forget to take the survey that will pop up at the end of the webinar. Uh, we really appreciate your feedback and we really do listen to it um, and make adjustments for future webinars. Uh, our next upcoming Future City HQ webinar is going to be the Mentor Best Practices and Advice webinar on October 15th at 4 p.m. Eastern. Um, so be sure to tell your mentors that they can sign up and 
be a part of this um, fun uh, presentation as well. Um, that's in a couple weeks, um, and everybody um, who's already registered should have received an email about it, um, but if your mentor is not yet registered, you can have them email info at futurecity.org, and I can get them a, the registration link. And any other questions or comments that you have, feel free as well to send those to info at futurecity.org. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.